Hello everybody, my name is Ray. Welcome to the Evangelical Dark Web. Tonight, we got a couple of topics that I wanted to uh, weigh in on. Two topics that are large enough to be their own videos, but let's just have a little bit more fun talking about it live with the audience uh, in the process as we discuss uh, the Pearl Davis versus the Prodigal Daughter, which was a live stream topic that we did a couple of weeks ago. And there has been some major updates to that story, and I wanted to kind of weigh in on it. Because we left off on a, a bearish note on that issue. So I kind of wanted to retouch up on the issue again because there's some new information and definitely a lot more to say, you know, with the whole Pearl Davis weighing in on the situation as an authority on, you know, the Bible, I guess. So definitely wanted to touch up on that. Uh, and then Tucker Carlson had a major interview with... Uh, Munther Isaac, and I thought that, that was a really interesting interview. He's a very interesting character, and I kind of wanted to break that down as well. So, uh, how are you doing, Anthony? All is well. I am awesome. up to speed on both, except maybe not the Pearl stuff, but you know, have I have seen the Tucker interview and have seen the uh, two hours and 20 minutes of Michael Knowles. Okay, so I was going to ask if you had seen the uh, both of those but it was two hours and it was a pretty long two hours i'm not gonna lie like it's not the easiest watch the tucker carlson interview we're gonna play some clips at that at 1.25 speed it's very easy to go through uh to be honest and then we also have uh yeah but the michael knowles interview it, it's very long i don't want to focus too much time on doing clips of that because you know uh trying to do representative samples of the entirety, but there is a couple sections that I thought were particularly noteworthy and interesting. I see uh, Yellow Moth is back and saying that, you know, Ray and Anthony are the only e-thoughts he needs. And I appreciate that, I think. Uh, but while we're at it, uh, drop a like uh, since we're here. And I don't have a teaser uh, issue to discuss this week i think next week i'm planning a wild stream next week which we'll talk about conservatism and whether conservatism is dead or not so that'll be a pretty interesting uh live stream because i got some clips that are pretty wild in my opinion uh for that lined up but i didn't want to combine that with this live stream topic uh because there's a lot going on here so uh with that said I wrote an article that was a follow-up uh, called uh, Pearl Davis versus the Prodigal Daughter. Uh, it's live on evangelicaldarkweb.org. And uh, yeah, I use the same thumbnail from the live stream that we did and not the current live stream, which is more applicable to the headline. But nonetheless, uh, I had a lot, lot to say about the interview with Michael Knowles. I am a lot more... Um, uh, I, I think I'm starting to believe her sincerity a lot more than I was initially. So I, I guess that's good news, but I obviously have some major reservations that I guess we're going to discuss today. So what were your initial thoughts? Because I've kind of given my initial thoughts on the interview that it actually, to me, raised a level of confidence. Uh, do, did you have that same uh, takeaway? I am kind of on the fence i mean i i go back to the original article on this where i said the first red flag was the church that baptized her and it was confirmed in her interview that it was a spontaneous baptism so there was no consult consultation with the pastor not that that church really has real pastors or is a real church so that would be one of the concerns obviously i thought there was still kind of a a disrespect for the parents which again was another concern that was a huge concern yes and that that is still present in the interview with her and you kind of talk about it in the article talking about the love languages and that her parents didn't love her and ironically and she was told that by a therapist yeah that was that's what that was one of my notes to do. that was one of my notes that therapy treated her as a victim which again is not necessarily a statement about her being failed by her therapist but it is more of a statement of therapy as a, as a whole is that it treats the patient as a victim of their circumstances. And when 
in reality, it's the therapist that should have been saying, you need to listen to your parents because, you know, shut your hole, know your role, kind of, kind of a reality check. And it does seem like, like the fact that she understood this presumably at the time. So, I mean, it, it again, they're, they're P bad. I mean, it's kind of my takeaway from that part, but I mean, and the third part was concerned was her going legitimate as a gangster. And I don't think that has been assuaged at all. Yeah. You and think that's, she's going to be the, my, you don't think she's going to be the Michelle Corleone of, uh, you know, e thoughts. I mean, at the end of the that the Knowles interview, she talks about how her and her husband are starting some weird agency. A TikTok to, agency. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's literally just transitioning. And she's still, and her name's not even Nala. We don't even know her real name. And yeah, she's still I, maintaining I, her brand. She's just going legitimate. That was my concern. And that nothing in the interview, actually, she kind of made it worse from the interview. Really? Based on the fact she's talking about setting up an agency to help other women transition out, either out of porn or instead of going into porn, do this instead, which just sounds like a bunch of unmarried e thoughts on the internet that don't sell porn, but basically rely on their sex appeal to, I don't know, make sourdough bread. So, and the last thing we need is more unmarried women on the internet making content. Okay. So, I, I actually like Joshua Michael's comment, which is why I'm going to. Kind of just address it right here. Uh, the Tucker versus Israel is much more interesting and pertinent than the Pearl Cole burner versus fake Christian OnlyFans thought grifter. And there, there is a sense in which they're true, but here's why both of them have a, a certain importance. Uh, one is a theological, you know, it's about someone's salvation. It's what, you know, th there's a lot of theology to discuss and unpack here uh, that underlies the entire Pearl davis versus uh prodigal daughter uh thing and you know at the end of the day th this is a ministry so we are going to talk about that obviously the israel tucker thing has a lot of theology there too then that's why we want to discuss both of these uh but with that said th there's some things i want to discuss because you know this is this is probably a channel that skews male probably so uh there's a lot of things about the pornography industry that I think we should be more fighting and we should be fighting the influences of it with a more modern understanding. And a story like this can help us to do that, in my opinion. So uh, th there's stuff that I want to do with this story that's going to go beyond, I, I hope, the uh, the usual debate surrounding it. And uh, for, to some extent, I mean, red pill content has has also been something we were early on for the record. I mean, cause we, cause we were talking about red pill before uh, like Christian Post and a lot of these more mainstream outlets started kind of talking about like a lot of this stuff. So, I mean, it's just something we were, I guess, early on last year. So that was, that was when a lot of like the whatever stuff really started taking off. And as for the uh, Tucker Carlson, I, I want to practice some discernment that I don't think you're going to get from other ministries when it comes to uh, Munther Isaac. And, you know, I'm not saying he's a, a false teacher, but he does appear as someone who's willing to work with false teachers, in my opinion. Uh, it's so he's like Lutheran or something. Or... No, it's not because he's Lutheran. So I wanted to highlight this uh, part of the interview. And to me, this was the part, the first hour, I don't really think she's all that sincere in the first hour. I think in the second hour, she's far more sincere. And it's when she starts talking about her husband, because lo and behold, there's like a female instinct that wants what's natural, you know, that wants what's natural for life. And that's kind of my read on that situation. I don't know if it's your read on the situation, but you know, at the end of the day, uh, she thought that, you know, being an e-thought would be bad for her marriage or bad for ever getting married and was kind of resigned to her fate a little bit. And all of a sudden she had the opportunity to change that and does and is happier for it. So I, I wanted to highlight this because this was part of the insincerity that I kind of felt from her interview. 
this is the part I'm thinking of. I ha I did write a note down for it. So go ahead. I said that in my last interview as well. Like if 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 you could go back and if someone could have said something to you, would you have changed your mind? And the answer is a million percent mm. because I know how I react to to love, to true love. Like I feel the genuine genuineity in it. <laughs> I feel yeah, that, enough, I think, yeah. yes, I feel like if somebody, I don't know who, but a friend or a boyfriend or my parents or my one of my siblings could have sat me down and didn't say anything elaborate, but just, hey, like, this is not it. Like, expressed the... <sighs> the warning in this hmm. like warned me in any manner because i didn't know anyone in the field nobody in only yet i'd only just kind of had people around me that were in my previous life and that was it but i didn't have any friends like no friends at all hmm. i was just kind of working every single day and that was it in my little apartment with my dog like wow. that was it so um i wasn't really like in the outside world i was just kind of in all the time just you so, and a computer basically that's it and my iPhone, like that was it. And like I had sets kind of set up around my home to do like different cosplay shoots and stuff, but that was it. Like my home wasn't even look like a home. It was like a big studio. Mm. So um, if someone would have said like, hey, you are worth so much more than this, or I was really struggling with insecurity at the time and thought that was like why I needed the attention and the attention did feel good. and. For people out there wanting to be like, oh, she just wanted attention. You're absolutely right. I wanted attention. Um, whatever that attention looked like, I didn't care because I just needed to feel something, you know? And I feel like I craved that so much was just being able to feel something. And that's definitely a wrong way to go about it. But I did it and I can't take it back. But there was a lot of crucial moments in my life, like in old that world that broke me and continued breaking me and then it was like it's like when you're in the military i've never been in the all right so that's the part that i wanted to, the first clip that i wanted to share and honestly i thought that was cringy i mean yeah. if only someone had told her the right way then she wouldn't have done it. i don't believe that at all that's not because true. it's not it's also not biblical i mean let's be honest jesus has a whole parable about you know if only someone had told us you know it's called the rich man and lazarus if only someone had told him then then they surely would have believed and jesus says a man could be raised from the dead and he wouldn't believe him so this is kind of what i read in the article nala is quick to liken herself to the prodigal son and is myth that she did not receive the warm welcome that the biblical character received in fact, she shared how her parents are getting divorced a second time. Yet before all of this, she uses the love languages to argue that her parents did not love her effectively and that at her acting out as a teenager was a cry for love. That is a quote uh, from her counselor as a teenager, uh, which was the advice of a counselor she went to. In the interview, she expressed how her parents disowned her for doing pornography, which was a biblical, which is a biblical response, by the way. Uh, and we've talked about that before. Yet she also insists that someone, if someone had told her the right way not to go down this path, she would have listened, even though she describes herself as rebellious and stubborn. So those are my uh, some of my notes on the section that we just talked about. Uh, Rick asked, uh, she got married recently, right? Yes, this is the public announcement. It is in this interview that she gives a public announcement on uh, getting married. It also should be noted before this instance, she actually talks about that she would not change her life or she doesn't like she is remorseful for her actions, but she wouldn't have changed it, which I don't think is really a proper mortification of one's sin. Like, again, this is why that like getting a consultation before a baptism is like essential because I don't think Paul would say, you know, if I had to do it over again, I wouldn't have like, you know, given the thumbs up or I would still have given the thumbs up for Stephen's death. I don't think Paul is saying that. That is an interesting thought because 
and this is where the conversation actually gets much deeper than I think she realizes is she is actually, she's bringing up a point where it's like, man, are we going to debate, you know, our obedience to, you know, God's providence? Uh, is it better that we just never, you know, never to have sinned and then we're saved or, you know, to have sinned greatly and then been, you know, received so much grace to give more glory to God. You know, it's kind of like a, I don't, it's a math equation in a sense that we cannot quantify because we're not God, you know, but a, a lot of the events that happened, God ordained so that he would get the glory. And you see that all throughout the old Testament specifically, you know, each Pharaoh refuses and refuses and refuses so that God would be glorified in the end. Uh, Gideon, you know, sends home, all the soldiers that were fearful that were about to get, you know, that hadn't, you know, consummated their marriages or their fields yet, or, you know, were sipping water out of their cupping it in their hands rather than lapping it like dogs. Like he sends all those people home just so God would get more glory in the end. So that is, is kind of what seems like is at play with the debate here, but I don't think we could argue that it was, it would be greater to, uh, I don't think it would be greater for her to have gone down this path rather than to just listen. Uh, if her parents did in fact give her sound teaching and follow that, uh, because what we're saying here is she's still not honoring her parents at all. And I don't think she's really taking much responsibility for her role in that relationship and when she talks about when her mother said oh i i hope you're happy in your life and how she was broken from that i don't i i mean i'm not a mother uh, and certainly not a mother of a prodigal child but there is something about that that seems like that's what a lot of mothers would say in that situation without compromising in a way it, it so she uh I, I don't at least she says she that her relationship with her siblings has improved but otherwise uh I, you know I, I see a lot of issues here yeah i mean that that i mean she didn't really describe her siblings relationship and i guess any of the prior statement or in like the whatever podcast and i don't know i don't know if you have this lined up as far as one of your clips goes but when she's she does actually make some lies in this interview so what would you I say did, is a lie i mean the big one being that her body count i think i don't actually believe her when she talks about her body count only being like three dudes or something so yeah i'll i'll read this uh section in the in the article that I wrote, because I thought this was pretty interesting was that uh, she talks about uh, basically how her whole persona was a lie. So Nala is a masterful marketer and she attributes her success in OnlyFans to her carving out the unique niche of weebs and gamers. I, I got to pause right there. Is that really a unique niche? is weebs and gamers i mean i think anime is gay so in the fact that she talked and, about she's into anime it's just like well okay well, let me actually say of uh, gamers because we got some older people in the audience gamers is people who play video games a lot weebs are people white people specifically who like anime and want to learn japanese because they like anime it also should be like noted that. that, like, if you know anything about Twitch or Twitch, if you think of a Twitch streamer, it's generally like a busty woman that plays video games and doesn't necessarily have like proficient skills in video games. It's just people watch her because she's hot. That's that's what a Twitch streamer. That's like the archetype of a Twitch streamer. So what I'm saying is like, there is no way that she just magically carved out a niche between weebs and, and, and gamers. And she was the only e thought that ever thought of that niche. Just saying, I, I, mean, I don't might, really buy She it. might be better. I mean, yes, I, I will concede her talent at marketing herself, but I'm just not going to pretend like this was a niche that was untapped 
until she came along. I just think that's ridiculous. I mean, there's a whole thing about having four letters is like, you know, good branding and stuff like Nike with four letters. Uh, really, it, it's kind of like a thing in comedy. Nala, where, four letters. I mean, uh, there, there's like a science in comedy that words that end with K are funnier. So instead of saying money, you say buck because it's funnier. So that's, I guess, something at, at the, you know, at the end of the day, it's like McDonald's. Why is McDonald's special is because it, the, of the name. At least that's what Ray Kroc said in the movie uh, Founder with uh, Michael Keaton. It's the name that made it special. And Nala was a good name because she named herself after the character in The Lion King. So, but she is the lying queen in a way, because despite perception, uh, actually, let me read the sentence first. At numerous numerous times in the interview, she states that she has a leader. She is a leader and has a CEO mentality. So, before we get into the lying queen, I, I kind of want to talk about this. That she, at the same time, she you know wants to be a submissive wife or whatever, but she also rejects gender roles and i just had a major issue with that you know she clearly rejects biblical gender roles i mean yeah the whole i'm a leader mentality and she still kind of wants to do she thinks she's like a boss babe and that she has the capabilities of being a boss babe it's like no that's why you basically did porn for as long as you did, because you don't actually have skills. She couldn't rise up fast enough in dentistry. So, and then despite uh, perception, her body count was considerably lower than one would expect three and five years when she passed off, which she passed off as numerous men. One of them even went into homosexuality to tap that market, but her brand as a nymphomaniac cheater was a facade. And this is according to her words in the interview. Yeah, I mean, so, I think this is a lie. And again, I'm 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 going to take the word of uh, uh, what is it, Bachelor or Joker Bachelor who actually did like a reaction video to this, and I'm guessing he did the research required because again, you look up this girl; her st- content is all over the internet still. And let's be honest. According to him, and, you know, I'm not gay, so I'm not going to investigate this matter for myself. I'm not trying to look at pornography in my daily life. So I'm just going to take the butcher's word for it, that there was more than three different sausages involved. And I'm just going to take the word for it and that she's lying. And also on the the, uh, whatever, she does talk about pegging women. I'm going to assume that because she said that on – the whatever podcast that there is content that there was content behind your paywall that probably uh might pertain to that kind of stuff since she did well talk about- here's what she said in the interview that that the on the whatever podcast she had just come off of a breakup so she was feeling angry at the time yeah the, that was the first appearance but I, the same, I, I just... so again I, I don't necessarily buy her body count explanation again the guy said that there's three distinct i mean he used the term bananas but let's just be honest because her explanation was because you couldn't see the guy's face or whatever it was the same you know banana going it was the same banana but you know she just said she met this guy at the mall or at the bar to make it look like she sleeps with anyone so at the end of the day what she's really saying is that her brand was to lie which is all of pornography is a lie to some degree. Uh, Constitution too. Y- y- they're selling a fantasy. They're selling a fantasy that's an obvious lie. Uh, I think she made the comment that, oh, and I'm a redhead. Like, you are not a redhead. You've just dyed your hair red. That does not make you a redhead. So even that's a lie. And uh, then she wants to go legitimate with the uh, OnlyFans talent agency, which, or sorry, not the TikTok talent agency, which I thought was uh, kind of weird. So you actually have some information on the uh, the husband, I guess. So you had some things to kind of contribute to that. Because this is, the when she talks about her husband, I actually think she's the most sincere when she does that. 
Yeah, I mean. Um, and I think I, it's because of natural desires, natural affections. And that's just my read on the situation because when when she's talking about what she did, her growing up, she doesn't really sound all that genuine to me. Yeah, so, I mean, again, I, you know, someone actually did, you know, fact check her on the the body count thing, and I'm gonna take their word for it. I don't, I don't believe her exp explanation is credible. But so, here's as far as the husband goes, I mean, ironically, according to his TikTok, he believes that the eclipses were a a divine sign from God. So he is kind of one of those people. So uh, I mean, well, we I, just did a video on John Hagee. Yeah. So he's kind of in that camp, except he thinks because the because there's an eclipse now and then there's an eclipse in the future. And he believe I guess he's trying to tie it out that it's it because it makes like a Hebrew letter. He's doing something like that, that it's a sign from God. So. Uh, I also wanted to point out that one thing that she said in the whatever podcast was that she was funding her parents. Uh, she was giving money to her family with the OnlyFans money. That does, you know, that's nowhere to be found in the Michael Knowles interview. Yeah. I thought that that was uh, very interesting that she in the whatever podcast was basically saying that she, uh, you know, was making so much money, giving it to her family. And then this was causing a rift in her family. And then all of a sudden, no, her parents... Well, not necessarily United Front if they're getting divorced a second time, but they didn't. Uh, th there's no mention that she was funding them or giving them money over the course of this thing. So enter Pearl Davis, uh, who's won the 2023 Grifter of the Year uh, on Evangelical Dark Web's year end live stream. She won Grifter of the Year. And she says uh, she has a nine point plan, I believe, or sorry an eight point plan that she believes that Nala is following. Number one, sell your butthole on OnlyFans. Number two, make $9 million. Number three, find God and post a video about it. Number four, raise prices on OnlyFans. Number five, spend months doing podcast tours, taking more OnlyFans money. Number six, finally delete OnlyFans and start conservative commenter, commentator career. Number seven, become preacher. Number eight, make nine million dollars so she believes that this is this uh arc is going to be a circle uh your thoughts on that i mean i think she's probably a majority right on that i mean obviously some of those things already did happen so she did like all the raise prices and then deleted the only fans that did happen yeah so i wanted to talk about that and i i invited ryan back on but he couldn't make it on and we kind of discussed this on Twitter. I did not believe that her reason for not delete for not deleting the OnlyFans was all that valid when she was basically talking about, oh, I'm not going to delete my OnlyFans because I need it for taxes. No, you, you don't. W two or, or I nine or whatever from only you will get your 2023 tax information in January. Yeah, or I, I don't believe sorry. only. I don't I do not believe for a second that OnlyFans is taking, you know, four months to get your tax information. I don't believe that for a second. They probably got that to her they by probably January twenty. Probably had well, I think they have to. January twentieth to January twenty fifth is probably when they had her tax information sent to her and she received it. Just I mean, saying. I'm gonna call that out hundred percent. She still has till April, and maybe she does have, who knows? But now her 2024 information she could just enter manually even if they don't send her one because it's income that she received she can just report it to the government and not uh you know commit tax evasion so i think that's a very bad excuse does not work so my read on that situation he uh uh ryan did didn't fully agree with that but yeah she doesn't need because if she's just waiting on tax information uh, she still has a 2024 tax returns, so she would basically not delete her entire account until next year because of tax reasons. That that's that excuse doesn't fly with me. I think it's more biblical to just do it manually, so you don't have to have the reproach of still having an OnlyFans account. Uh, is my I mean, I don't buy situation. any. I don't buy any tax information because that's like again, you're gonna get the 
it's either W2 or 1099, regardless of whether, even if you worked only one day a year, you only earned like- No, $500. $500 or whatever the minimum is, then you're still going to get that regardless. So, and then Pearl Davis had to come out and say that she hates the uh, parable of the prodigal son. So, and this is so, kind of I mean, where I kind of end the article. She is a prodigal daughter. I mean, she, she is, is a prodigal daughter in a sense. So I'm going to read, uh, you know, so Pearl Davis, you know, she is a lapsed Catholic or a lapsed papist, I should say, who openly disagrees with God's word and message. I mean, Pearl Davis is a grifter, and Pearl Davis is very honest about being a grifter. She's done interviews where she talks about just wanting to be uh, successful and have a career in media. That's what motivates her. That's what she wants in life. And guess what? That's what she's getting in life. She's just, you know, she, she wants a media career. She's got a media career. She doesn't really have anything useful to say because what she could be doing is making content for to, you know, make women better. But instead, she's making content to reiterate the grievances of men. But she's not a man, so she can't really accurately speak to those grievances. So that's my read on that, on the whole uh, Pearl Davis situation. And. Her disdain for the prodigal son, a parable that showcases how those in God's fold will be redeemed, reveals how just how far the kingdom from the kingdom she is. The personal hypocrisy of denouncing the value of a woman because of age while living as an aging single woman, denouncing a false convert for grifting while appealing to religion for her grift, and supporting men like Andrew Tate as not too far gone while a woman... Uh, while disavowing a woman who left the lifestyle that Andrew Tate made his fortune in is astounding. This is astounding hypocrisy out of Pearl Davis. And it just reeks of, you know, game recognized game, too much familiarity. You can't come on my turf. Basically what I, my read of uh, Pearl Davis sniffs uh, Nala does not like her for that reason. Yeah, and I mean, of course, this, the rest is why we don't need movement. a TikTok agency helping unmarried women create content because they can't they they can't get the skills to either land a man or have a real job. So they want to be influencers still. We don't need more unmarried female influencers. And Pearl Davis is also exhibit A for this entire. Article. Yeah. I mean, last week we talked about Savannah Hernandez going off against birth control. So again, it's, it's ubiquitous across the industry. So uh, that being said, my final thoughts were it's reasonable criticism to say that Nala does a poor job of warning women from entering the porn industry. After all, talking about money, not buying happiness is not compelling to people who have never made $9 million in front loaded labor income as opposed to passive income. So I'm making a, a technical distinction because what she did was not passive income. Uh, a lot of people use that term flippantly to mean like front loaded She's not income. Receiving rent payments. Right. But like that. that's front loaded income because you had to buy the thing. But in any case, uh, yeah, I, I don't really like, I don't really care to hear people say, oh, money doesn't buy happiness. I can guarantee you that if I had $9 million, I would be a lot happier. I'm just saying. Well, I mean, she talked about happier. going from a Porsche to, which again, yeah, that's a nice. To a honest, uh, no, to, to a Jeep, Jeep or whatever. Jeep Wrangler Rubicon, which again, a Rubicon is over 50 grand new. You would know, you used to sell cars. Yes. And a, a Rubicon, that's the highest trim level. And I'm going to presume it's a JL, which means it's a new body style. And I'm going to assume that, you know, it's, a fit, it's north of $50,000. Yeah, and the context for it's that line record. was like, oh, I drive a Porsche. And Michael Knowles is like, but you'd be happy just driving, you know, a Honda Civic money. She's like, uh, no, uh, Rubicon money or whatever. Or like, she wow. said cheap. Which again, yeah, I'm not going to knock her for because. It's a high-end car though. I mean, Jeep is a luxury brand and, you know. Most people don't realize, or it's not as obvious on the, on the surface, but it's a luxury brand and that's why they exist. So unlike the prodigal son, however, 
Nala did not lose everything. In fact, she gained the whole world, got rich, redeemed her soul, and got married. Unfortunately, this is not a cautionary tale. Even the depths of her depravity were mitigated in this interview. And this is talking about how, you know, if everything that she said was a lie and that, you know, she's just only sleeping with three dudes in five years uh, doing pornography, then yes. Yeah. Uh, then even her sin wasn't as bad as initially perceived from the whatever podcast. She's a lion king as opposed to, you know. And, you know, based on that interview, her body count might be less than Pearl Davis's. But uh, with that said, she's not a cautionary tale. And I think that's why people are skeptical of her. That's why people don't really like hearing her testimony as much. Because basically, she sinned. She got rich sinning. And she avoided the natural consequences of the sin that she committed. And people don't like that about her. I think to some extent she still wants to maintain that platform. So it's not, I don't even know how much of it is, you know, the dog wagging the tail, tail wagging the dog as far as whether she wants the spotlight or the, the spotlight wants her. I do definitely think she still wants the spotlight. And I definitely kinda, think it's the, uh, she wants and the spotlight. Not, and obviously, you know, Michael Knowles is, you know, being savvy and booking this interview, striking while the iron's hot. So it's not like there's not a motive there. And, you know, people are talking about his interview. So, you know, he knew, he knew how to play the game. But at now, the end of the day, quick end of the day, she still wants to maintain her brand. She should be changing her brand. Instead of Nala, she should be Natalie or whatever her actual name is. So, quick question. How do you think Michael Knowles did in the interview? All things considered. He's very congenial in person, so I don't want to, like, take away from this is what he should have done when that's not necessarily his personality. But he was very congenial. Perhaps he should have maybe pushed back a little bit more, uh, particularly on, you know, the, the TikTok agency thing at the end. And I think you should have asked more questions based on our previous interviews. Yeah. Like you should have asked her about the whole, you've been paying money to your family. You said that you did that. Is that true? Uh, I mean, he seemed to have came in with very little research because obviously he said he did, wasn't too familiar with who she is. Uh, and I don't know how much research he did beyond basic clips like the cheating, the nymphomaniac cheating clips. Uh so uh, we got Yellowmouth says Michael Knowles kept throwing out big names and big concepts trying to sound smart. So that was, I mean, that's situation. just kind of, that's just Michael Knowles. Uh, I, I mean, obviously he's going to talk about Aristotle and the Summa Theologica and, Th you know, Thomas Aquinas. So, I mean, yeah, that, that, that just is Michael Knowles. I, I've read that at times. Uh, and then we have, uh, Innovation can HQ. How likely do you think it is she's going to be back on the whatever podcast? As I would bank on that. Bet, bet money on that one. And then she's sitting next to Brian instead of on the other side. Yeah, she'll be on the uh, the bro side, not the host side of that of that podcast. So, but either 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 way, at the end of the article, I say, given that the OnlyFans is finally deleted, she has embraced modesty and marriage. Her faith appears to an sincere. However, she needs to get out of the spotlight because she is not by design a leader in the church or Christianity. Her testimony, while something we should praise God for, is also something where the message could get easily distorted because her aforementioned marketing skills are well in play here. Uh, and again, if, I don't, and this is more charge against her husband. I don't think he's doing a good job at all. Uh, he's doing. He's done a considerable job to get her out of that industry. I, oh. I, let's give him credit there. Fair enough, but uh, I mean, yeah, I don't think he's the best leader in faith. Okay, uh, and young. I don't know how old he is, but it's something that it's a role that you have to grow into. It 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 should come more naturally than it does. So, uh, and I conclude the article by saying, if like Paul, she spends years studying in Antioch and then emerges, her testimony will be far more compelling. 
Nala's testimony is about God's mercy for sparing the sinner the most drastic of natural consequences while redeeming her their soul. Um, however, the so-called baby Christian is not equipped for celebrity. We do not want another Kanye situation. So that's how I kind of that's how I conclude that article. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it is best for her to just walk away. Yeah, leave it I, for one. She is not her in the spotlight when she has a history of being a compulsive liar. If what she said in that Michael Knowles interview is true, then she is historically a compulsive liar. And I love the part where she talked about the interview is like when she talked about, oh, I was just selling lewd photos, but I was talking to the guys like she wasn't lying to the guys to make them think that they had a chance. Like she really underplayed the game that she was running when she was doing the only fans and getting into it early on. And, you know, her talking to her Johns, she was really underselling how much she was doing and how evil what she was doing was because she was manipulating them into getting, you know, into an emotional relationship, which they were stupid for, you know, trying to get from a prostitute online, but nonetheless, yeah, I mean, it, it, it goes back to mortification of sin. Right. Which again, I understand you're not going to have that on day one. And, and that's what Andrew Tate made his fortunes doing. Cause he would be on the keyboard. Yeah, he said he, he was knew what guys would, you know, go crazy about hearing. So he apparently made, only fan or not only fans at the time i think it was you know the predecessors to only fans he was making bank because he was the guy typing to the johns because he knew exactly what they wanted to hear but she does go into how she read dating books to kind of understand what guys want to hear and then use that so she she's a compulsive liar and that's her past but that's the part about her past that we don't exactly focus on because we focus on the only fans part and we're not quite ready for, okay. Modesty is something that she's going to have to learn as a Christian, but honesty is also something she's going to have to learn as a Christian as well. Yeah. I think that kind of talk was brought up with her, maybe talking about her inability to feel emotions because I guess she shut herself off or she becomes numb, which again, that would happen because you're just, you're a dishonest person. You just stop feeling emotions one might say you lose your empathy, so to speak. So maybe the fact that she's being honest with her husband is perhaps, you know, why she started, you know, when she talks about her faith, bringing back her ability to feel is because she's actually being honest. So, yeah, I think that's a good insight. Um, I'm getting ready to transition into Tucker Carlson. So uh, any last words on the subject? I mean, jury's still out. I mean, obviously, bear the uh, wait for the fruit. I mean, I don't necessarily like the fact that she was kind of using those kinds of lines when, you know, she should just, you know, be Captain Cliche and one day at a time. But other than that, I mean, you know, wait and see as far as I'm concerned. I don't necessarily think it's convincing. But again, you, it's best that, that she goes away and like lives peacefully. Right. Study in Antioch for a few years. No, I don't yeah. quite know long, how long Paul was in Antioch, but it was a pretty long time. But I mean, Antioch's the third largest city in Rome. And he had to escape in a breadbasket, right? So Tucker Carlson did an interview with uh, Munther Isaac. And this interview was pretty wild. He got, you know, it's basically, I don't know if you're familiar with the George Bush meme. It was like from, you know, the original 9-11, you know, when he's like getting someone's whispering into his ears about the tower being hit. But someone's like. A second conservative commentators come out against Israel <laughs> and it's like, yes, a message was sent, you know, a ca calls are being made uh, to shut down Tucker Carlson. And, and one thing that's to see that important to realize is that Tucker Carlson uh, kind of peeved the wrong people when he was at fox news and you know this group of people wanted him fired i thought but, it was yeah he worked for uh yeah you know, there's a woman that he worked for and you know they they want well, to that too but like like the adl wanted tucker carlson fired right and i think so, that was that was supposedly like the under the handshake agreement with dominion with the fox news dominion lawsuit was 
Tucker Carlson gone? Certainly a possibility. So one of the things that was brought up in uh, or, or is on Munther Isaac's uh, stuff is he promotes a conference. And in that conference, he's got some pretty woke people speaking. And my biggest concern, and I've reached out to him to see if he'd be interested in an interview, but I don't think I'm going to get a response because uh, website contact forms just, you know, rarely get any contact out of those. But in any case, uh, I would press him on more theological questions uh, just to kind of see, hey, is this guy another theological liberal or is he just someone who works with theological liberals? Because his bylines include Sojourners, which is a magazine that was funded by George Soros. And they've kind of taken some you know, Soros money in the past. So they like pro-gay. Yes, it is an extremely woke magazine and he's done writing for them before. And a lot of people who, you know, Jamar Tisby has touted this guy. A lot of bad guys have lauded this guy in the past. Now, I know when I when I wrote about the whole Palestine-Gaza thing, I did the Michael Brown versus uh, Palestinian Christians. I did talk about, like, some of these Palestinian Christians are seem very liberal and very globalist. They hate colonialism, which I don't necessarily blame them, given, you know, where the context of where they live was essentially colonized, you know, in, a, in the actual definition of colonialism. But they do have a lot of very liberal presuppositions that that they have, which would make them natural allies to a lot of these woke liberals in America, even though he might be, uh, you know, pretty, pretty uh, against homosexuality himself. Yeah. So that's just something that needs to be disclaimed i don't think anyone else who's covering this is going to talk about hey this guy's kind of a flaming theological liberal or adjacent to flaming theological liberals because i don't know necessarily him per se but he he works with the, some bad people and i think that needs to be highlighted maybe he just doesn't know that he's you know if I were to you know, work with an outlet in a foreign country, I might not know the ins and outs of that country's media. That's fair. Maybe that's the case here. Uh, another thing that's worth noting is that it is pretty well known that Christians in the Middle East do not like Israel. This is true in basically everywhere but the Israeli Christians that kind of are like hardcore Zionist. But, you know, when it comes to Lebanese Christians, Syrian Christians, uh, you know, because I mean, Israel bombs their countries on a on a very regular well, basis. So why I'd would say any... I'd say Iraqi Christians, but, you know, we we took well, care of them. We, we got like that clip coming up. Okay. We got that clip coming up. I mean, as far um, as Lebanon goes, I mean, we Israel intercedes into their war and then the Beirut bombing happens. And, and then. Yeah. Armenian Christians don't like Israel because Israel is helping to uh, giving weapons to Azerbaijan, who is ethnic cleansing portions of their disputed territory from, you know, getting the Armenians out of there. So that's being done with Israel, you know, fully financed or is basically financing and supplying an ethnic cleansing of Armenian Christians. So. With all that said, Israel also has the lowest percentage of Christians of its surrounding countries. Even the nation of Jordan, surprising as it may be, has a higher percentage of Christians than Israel does. I thought that that was surprising. It's close, but it's still higher. So here is Tucker Carlson. We're going to listen to the first clip. Uh, about foreign policy when it comes to Palestine and Israel. So you have people in the United States, self-professed Christians, who are sending money to oppress Christians in the Middle East. That's the sad irony of all of this, is that a lot of the money uh, that comes from churches, even before the war, goes not just to the Israeli military, but to the building of settlements. Many of these settlements are built on land confiscated from Palestinians, and in many cases from Palestinian Christian families. So I hope you understand, again, how, uh, how difficult this is for us, because this is political and financial support from our siblings in Christ, rather than that support helping us or even helping humanitarian causes or peace causes or, you know, initiatives to bring Palestinians and Israelis together. It's supporting initiatives that are causing our lives as a Christian 
community more and more difficult and causing many of us to leave because it seems that there is no future for us uh, in this land. Uh, we're very troubled, we're very sad by all of this. And again, we continue to plead for the opportunity to be heard. We continue uh, to plead uh, with these evangelical leaders, come and listen and talk and see things with your own eyes. Uh, take our perspective seriously. Tucker, you mentioned something important about the war in Iraq and that war literally emptied half of the Christian population there. Uh, you know that Christian leaders pleaded with the American administration not to do that war and not to engage in it. And because we realize, they realize that uh, it's going to have some serious consequences, not just on the Christian presence, but on the region as a whole. And never, I think, did they anticipate that it will have this severe impact on the Christian presence in the Middle East. So again, I wish these leaders realize how damaging their position, their lobbying, their money is, even to our existence as Palestinian Christians and as Middle Eastern Christians uh, in general. It's very obvious. So uh, your thoughts on that opening uh, section there? Because uh, no, he brought up lot. the Iraqis, the Iraqi Christians, which you brought up. Which again, was, an, was basically a Zionist war because, you know, Israel basically wanted us to take out all their all their enemies perceived and, you know, not perceived. And Saddam Hussein was one of them. Bashir al-Assad is another. So the idea of America just being the the hired gun to take out all of Israel's problems, and that's why they want to goad us into a war with Iran. Like, Iran's not an enemy to the United States. Not they, naturally. Not naturally. They're, it's easier to make peace with them, honestly. And at the end of the day, Israel wants us to go to war with them in Iran to take out the final boss in their Middle Eastern, I guess, peace plan. Oh, peace or conquest. Yeah. Uh, because Israel, d demographically speaking, probably can't take Iran on in a war. No, and, it's Especially a very, and again, that would be the Iranians. The Iranians are very advanced in technology, specifically the, the technology that a far superior military isn't ready to grapple with and that is you know kamikaze drones uh iran is very much on top when it comes to producing oh. cheap drones that are you know can do as much damage as missiles that are far more expensive and shooting these drones down is more expensive than the damage that the drones yeah, they know how to fight the attrition war yes but again so it's a very ready for that it's a very defensible terrain if you ever look at like a map of iran yeah, very mountainous plot, oh very defensible not it would not be a fun encounter and a lot of americans would die in that more of you know when you look at the alexander the great more of his soldiers died crossing through the iranian you know the desert in iran than in a, any battle that they ever fought that is how defensible the terrain is naturally so and the other thing is he opens up with uh you know how do christians uh support you know bombing other christians and that's that was the big line in this interview from Tucker Carlson. You know, Christian, how do like Chris, calling out Christians for supporting money going to Israel, bombing Christians? Uh, and uh, Damizi uh, says, I was concerned when this preacher said the purposes should be for all religions to get together in peace. Uh, yeah, again little bit of red flags like that i don't know if it's a lutheran thing but you know i don't expect people to be as base as you know american evangelicals uh overseas i just don't just saying superior theology to me that many evangelical leaders in the united states care much more about the highly secular government of israel than they care about christian communities in the middle east why do you do you have a guess as to why that would be some of it is theology some of it is the theology of christian zionism uh, that teaches, uh, for example, uh, that Christians must support Israel because the Bible teaches that. And uh, oftentimes that is part of a larger uh, theology of the end times in which they view the presence of uh, Jews in the land as preparing for the second coming of Christ. They see it as a fulfillment of prophecy, uh, not realizing again what that means on the ground. I always say it's as if the land was empty to them. Uh, they are excited about certain events without understanding the consequences of these events on real uh, lives. Uh, the irony is that many of these positions actually believe, uh, and many evangelical leaders believe that at the end times and after Jews are gathered in Palestine, two thirds of them will be massacred uh, and only for the other third to convert to Christianity. And somehow they consider that uh, a Jewish friendly uh, theology. 
um, don't get me wrong, I am for Christians and Jews, just like I'm for all religions coming together, understanding one another. But there is something very problematic when we make a certain religious group as an object in our theology and even uh, eschatology and relate to them uh, accordingly, again, without really understanding what is happening uh, on the ground, uh, without understanding uh, even the complexity of Israel as a state, how secular it is, but even uh, how much uh, it is oppressing Palestinians, uh, breaking the international law, committing uh, sometimes you know human rights abusing documented against uh, Palestinians, including Palestinian uh, Christians. Uh, to me, Christians should be for peace. And uh, again, uh, I wish you were investing all of this energy and money in initiatives that uh, bring peace, uh, not continuing to support Israel unconditionally without holding them accountable, which is, in my opinion, what drove us to this mess right now with a catastrophe of thousands of Palestinians killed and October 7 and all of that. Uh, it's all of these policies. And uh, we continue to say that the church has been part of the problem. And it's one of my desires to see the church part of the solution when it comes to Palestine and Israel. Whether in this war or before, it was confirmed to me that the church is part of the problem. It'd be pretty easy for Republicans in the U.S. Congress to say we support the government of Israel. But if you touch a single Christian, harm a single church, prevent any Christian from practicing his religion, you're done. Not a single dollar uh, will come from the U.S. Congress for you. Um, that doesn't seem hard. I, I have to ask specifically about the church. So, yeah, I mean, it's a lot harder than it's that Tucker. Tucker Carlson went based. He's I don't a nice know if he's just, based right now. I don't know if he's just trolling on that, because let's be honest, Netanyahu has more control over our Congress than he does his own government. And we talked about that last week with the whole how he has a very he is basically a dead man walking in his own country because his coalition is fragile. As soon as this war ends, he's gone. They're going to dispose of him. Yeah, I don't blame them because he also let it happen. So it's kind of like the whole 9-11 thing. It's like, oh, Bush brought the country together for 9-11. He kept us safe. It's like, no, he 9-11 happened under his watch. Like, no. And that's not even getting into any conspiracy theories or anything like that. Yeah. It didn't well, ha which it also under his watch. Which those same theories would also involve the country in the Middle East. That's also true. Uh, I'm not an expert in those theories, actually, uh, to be honest. Uh, but with that said, I, I thought that that part was interesting because uh, then he talks about Christian Zionism as a political ideology. Now, I thought that it was only 144,000 Jews get converted, which would actually be considerably less than one third of the population of Israel. I mean, if we're counting like only men in that 144. And let's say we are and not women and children. Do we even get up? We don't get up to a million and the population of Israel is like what? Six million? I thought it was eight, but yeah. Okay. Well, I'm thinking of a I don't know why I thought of the number 6 million. Uh, but in any case, uh, there's another clip that I wanted to share uh, from this interview. A lot of long clips because this guy is kind of long winded. But uh, the comment that I read, the chat I read earlier about his possible, uh, you know, appeals to other religions. I, I would press him under. I would ask him about the exclusivity of Christ if I we're interviewing him. I would just ask this question as a baseline is, you know, Jesus, the only way to heaven, um, you know, do Islam and Jude Judaism, do they lead to hell? I would ask him these questions because I'm very curious. And he's in a difficult situation considering, I mean, if you're in Gaza, that's 2% Christian. Like you're not getting anything done if it as 2% of a pop. I was going to say as 2% of a population, even though said religion, there's a 2% of a population in America that gets a lot done. But yeah, I mean, you're a Christian in Gaza, which is 2% Christian, give or take. So not a large, not a large contingent of people. So maybe it's just because that's who he has. Like, those are the connections he has. But the gospel is stronger, right? So... Obviously, to you know, we a, a strong two percent can do a lot. Yeah, is what I'm gonna say. Uh, so, with that said, uh, this is the next portion that I want to share. Israel is is very often described in American media as the only democracy in the region. Democracy, of course, suggests religious freedom, pluralism. 
how free are Christians to practice Christianity in Israel? We cannot deny that there are many freedoms in, in, in the state of Israel. Yes. Uh, but it's not uh, as free as people think. And let me give you an example. And I know that this might come across as shocking to many. Do you know that evangelicals as churches are not officially recognized in Israel? The, not recognized uh, by the government by of the Israel? Way, by the government of Israel. Oh. Evangelism is illegal in Israel. And uh, Wait, I'm sorry, may I ask you just, just to stop there? What does that mean, evangelism is illegal in Israel? It's, it's against the law to evangelize in Israel and so, to cr proselytize, as they call it. Christian evangelizing is illegal in Israel? So I want to pause right here. So let's just provide a quick fact check of what he said. He said that evangelical Christianity is not a recognized religion in Israel. That is true. I looked it up. The closest you get to evangelical Christianity being recognized in Israel is Anglicanism. That is as close as it gets. I believe so the Anglicans are the only Protestants recognized in Israel. So it's so like a list him, of religions that are recognized, and these are the... Yes. Lutherans are not on it. Uh, Anglicans are Orthodox, various Orthodox churches and various, and, and the Catholic Church, obviously. They're recognized. Uh, yeah, he's not recognized. Lutheran Church, probably being German, might have something to do with not being recognized my thoughts on that uh and then he talked about israel it being illegal to evangelize even the voice of the martyr organization does recognize israel as more hostile to christianity now i wish that they would go further and recognize countries like canada as hostile to christianity and you know other countries like that are in the west is more hostile to christianity countries that jail pastors and such but we're not there yet but they do recognize israel as being you know, hostile to evangelism. They do recognize that. So what he said does pass a fact check. I did look it into it. I believe they recognize 12 uh, denominations, 12 or 14. But closest that I can get to it is Anglicanism. And it's not just because I have a uh, Book of Common Prayer uh, next to me. The conversion, uh, and so if you are a Jewish person and you convert to Christianity, you will, you will go through many legal uh, challenges to recognize your uh, uh, marriage certificate, um, to recognize a lot of your uh, rights, because again, uh, evangelical Christianity is not officially recognized as a denomination in the state of Israel. Uh, many uh, Israeli politicians try to pass laws that prevent Christians from sharing their, uh, their uh, faith. Uh, and so there is always this struggle and this tension about how much can Christians express their faith. Now, the biggest problem Christians are facing is in East Jerusalem, where they are constantly targeted by radical groups, radical Jewish groups. Let's be clear. Uh, sometimes some churches, uh, they tried, uh, there was an attempt to burn them. Um, oftentimes, and this is, you, you can look at it on social media uh, all over the place, uh, 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 Christian clergy being spit at by uh, these groups. Uh, they write very offensive slogans on the water, strong incitements against Christians, especially in the old city uh, of, of Jerusalem. So what, 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 what kind of slogans? Many... I'm sorry to ask you to pause. What kind of slogans? What kind of graffiti is written against Christians? Uh, in we don't want Christians get out of here. Some of, some of it is very, very offensive, actually, that I can say. Um, a lot of it is calling for Christians, uh, whether Christians or Armenian Christians. It's a small Christian community, part of the Christian community in East Jerusalem. Uh, we don't want you here, you should leave. Uh, so there are all these incitements against Christians, especially in uh, in Jerusalem. So I wanted to pause right there because I think he's not willing to say things that are blasphemous, which is probably what the graffiti actually says. But he is talking about a phenomenon that has been pretty, that has gone viral several times. Yeah, uh, I mean, I wrote a thing on, on, I think it's Sarah Wallace that was the missionary. She does her thing. And she was basically chased away by children, not just like a, a grown man or like a, like an angry mob. She was actually ch chased off by children. And I think they said it was because she was preaching on a Sabbath, which, okay, but, or using electronics or whatever on the Sabbath, which is weird given that there's like cars parked along the street and cars obviously have electronics. So I have a snotty question about that. Because you know how they have like all this kosher technology? 
and you know like a kosher refrigerator that the light doesn't turn on when you open it on a certain day or like you know there's little lights that you pull up to trick god into thinking i didn't turn on a light it was on the entire time i just turned it so i can enjoy the light anyway so yeah. it's kind of like that what about running heat in your home like that has you know i don't see how you know fire is bad uh starting a car is bad how is running heat in your home kosher well i mean i guess this is what happens when you know the law becomes the end all versus the spirit of the law which again i think the law says you don't start the fire so that means you can kindle it i think it's like you can kindle it you can't yeah, you can start kindle. a fire but you know if your heat is not going to be running 24 i saw a video it was it was a coffee maker you can't brew coffee on the sabbath but you go through more work to brew coffee on the sabbath than and again you can set a timer on most coffee pots so you're not actually brewing it you're actually doing it the night before and it autos it auto does its thing but you are brewing it <laughs> but, but you, you set it the night before so you didn't actually work on the sabbath you did all the work pre sabbath so I, I, again, I, don't I just kept the thermostat the same. The heat went on and the heat went off on its own. I didn't do any work. I, I don't necessarily see that as good logic, but, you know, it's just I, I turned the light thing and it now I, I pulled it open and now I can ha I have light in my room, even though I didn't touch. I didn't turn the light on. I just it was on the entire time. You know, it's just technology meant to trick God, I guess. Uh, that being said, we still have more. Uh, in this. And uh, one might say that when we expect to see radical groups in every uh, faith tradition, and I say, of course, yes, that exists. The problem is when they go unchecked and they're never held accountable, even when there are arsons, I mean, attacks on churches, oftentimes the complaint of the heads of churches in Jerusalem, the Catholics, the Orthodox, or Protestant, is that it seems that those who do these attacks are never held accountable. In fact, I think it was around two years ago when the heads of churches said in a statement, uh, that they feel there is a systematic attempt to empty Jerusalem of Christians. I mean, these are strong words. Uh, look at that statement from the heads of churches. Uh, so the impression that it's flowery here for uh, for Christians is, is, is definitely not true. But beyond that, we have to look at the wider political uh, spectrum because at the end of the day, Israel wants to be both democratic and Jewish. And, and many question whether that is uh, possible. Uh, and that's why, as I said, even Israeli human rights organizations have called out the policies and discrimination uh, policies of Israel. Um, the nation state law, for example, states, this is a, a law that was passed by the Knesset. It states that the right for self-determination in the state of Israel is exclusive to the Jewish people only. So this is a law that was passed by the Knesset that uh, makes Jews superior in the state of Israel because they are the only one they are. They have exclusively the right for self-determination. Uh, so that's the uh, end of the third clip, uh, the second clip, sorry, that I wanted to share. And that kind of, you know what that's eerily reminiscent of is what he said at the end about, you know, only Jews have self-determination in Israel is that that is eerily reminiscent of the National, you know, German Socialist Workers Party or National Socialist German Workers Party, very reminiscent of their language, which was and their rhetoric, which was Germans have a right to self-determination in Germany. Yeah, I mean, the people that hate nationalism, but, you know, this is obviously nationalism. Again, I'm not even against it in principle, but they don't want us to have us as America to have the right of self-determination. Right. And again, the part, of, part of the problem with uh, this guy and or a lot of the Palestinian Christians that I read about is that they're, they are embedded with liberation theology. Like they don't necessarily argue that you should be supporting Christians because Christians are the true Israel, the true church of God, your brothers and sisters in faith. They kind of do it more from a liberation theology standpoint. So they're not actually, they're not actually doing the i guess the biblical justifications that they should be doing to appeal to their brothers and sisters in faith yeah uh honestly th there's a lot of questions that i would like want to ask him because again you know i don't really view democracy as a necessity for a, a nation it's not biblical and honestly uh, democracy is not the feature of like the best functioning countries in the world don't even have democracies and they're doing 
just fine. Or they do have democracies, but they're very one party ish states. Yeah. But I, I just thought it was ironic because, you know, the big bads of all of world history, the Zionist believes that the Nazis are the preeminent villain of all of world history, but they're, you know, but Israeli rhetoric, Israeli law is eerily similar to that of the National Socialist German Workers Party. The irony is ironic. I do have one last clip to share, but I think I also might want to hit the very end as well, if I remember where that was. So. Well, if it would load. And that is the problem with using Twitter as a live streaming service here. So yeah. <laughs> I've noticed that on other people's streams, it doesn't always, you get the buffering circle of death. And which part, oh, of, which part are we getting to? Uh, that's a good question. I did not write in my notes down what exactly we were, <laughs> what exactly each clip was. I just wrote the time stamp. Consistent, but. I just wrote timestamps for what I wanted to highlight. <laughs> uh, there's a reason why I wanted to highlight this section, but I did not write it down. But here we go. Oh, you got to be kidding me. All right. Well, while that is loading, I'm going to figure this out. Because I noticed a lot of people did go after and started counter signaling Tucker Carlson at the end of this interview. Yeah, I saw Jordan Schachtel. It's just this section. I was it? Uh, the uh, Cyclops or Zyclops of uh, Dan Crenshaw. Zyclops. Is Zyclops. that what people are calling him now? I've heard Zyoclops. I think Zyclops comes a little bit easier off the tongue. Which is to say he's a Zionist Cyclops. But yeah, he came out against Tucker Carlson hard. And there's the whole Ben Shapiro just asking questions is anti-Semitic because you know, you're not allowed to ask questions, use the Socratic method. Which again, you know, it's unfortunate that that's the tactic of discourse is to ask questions. But, you know, when you get canceled for actually, you know, answering said questions, that's the problem. Right. This is ready. So the Speaker of the House in, uh, in the United States, third in line to the president, third most powerful person in our political structure, is a self-described evangelical Christian and a, a supporter of the government of Israel. And I, I would be interested in asking him what he thinks of the fact that Israelis who convert to Christianity have fewer rights. I don't know if he knows that. But he has said that he supports Israel for theological reasons, the ones that you described, that Christians have a moral duty to support the government of Israel um, because scripture tells them so. Is there any place in the older New Testaments that suggests or commands Christians to support the, the modern government, the secular government of Israel. Where does that come from? I haven't read that. But the problem is when you equate the modern secular state of Israel with the Israel of the Bible. The Israel of the Bible was a faith community in a covenant relationship with God uh, that was given the laws and asked to be a light to the nations. And uh, through that nation, we as Christians believe Jesus uh, came as a savior uh, to the world. The problem begins when you compare or when you uh, equate the modern secular state of Israel, a political entity birthed in the 20th century, with the people of Israel uh, in the Bible. And this takes the question, uh, which is a theological question of the chosen people, uh, into something that I call the chosen state. Uh, the Bible doesn't talk about a chosen state. And uh, to me, the biggest problem, again, is when we give special treatment to any people group, give privileges to any people group. Uh, Tucker, I'm a theologian, and to me, the idea of chosenness is never about entitlement. Chosenness is about responsibility. It's about our calling to be a light, to be a, uh, a blessing to others. We cannot change that into a theology of entitlement 
And definitely a state cannot take that and make it uh, the blueprint for being entitled and asking for everyone uh, as if to support them. And the problem here is that it's not like, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's the Christians who are saying this. It's the Christian pastors who are saying we are called to bless this, right? Because when you mentioned Mike Johnson, he said uh, when he became house speaker that as Christians, the Bible tells us we should support Israel. Uh, and I ask, what about the context? What if, hypothetically speaking, let's not get into our argument. What if? So I, I pause right here because I feel like we could come up with better hypotheticals than he does. I mean, his, I actually like a lot of you what know, he just said. You know, yeah, it's, it's like it's not a chosen. It's a chosen nation, not a chosen nation state. So he kind of makes that that distinction. Though you know, it's not entitlement; it's responsibility. And again, you know, look at the mindset, especially of Talmudic Judaism, which you know is a sense of entitlement. It is sort of an ethnocentric folk view of the world, and that's that's just the reality. So answer his question: Do you think Mike Johnson knows that it's illegal for Christians to be? or for Jews to convert to Christian, they are legally punished in Israel for that. Do you think Mike Johnson's aware of that? I'm not sure he knows that specifically, but I imagine he's aware or cognizant of the fact that there are restrictions on evangelizing. So I don't know if, I don't know if he's aware of like this ins and outs of what happens when, when, or if you convert. Cause I mean, he made it seem like, okay, you get married in a church and you, I guess, register that marriage with the state. It then there's maybe a little bit more hurdles in the bureaucracy. I'm not sure what other rights he's referring to that might get, I guess, stripped or uh, reduced. Law of return. If a Jew converts to Christianity, and you know we're talking like ethnic, I guess, and they convert to Christianity, the law of return will not apply to them automatically. That's the immigration, though. That's the immigration, but if. But you doing it in Israel might also affect your family's ability to do it yeah. as well. So, I mean, I, I imagine he's not aware of that. But he is probably aware that of the Jews spitting on Christians. I imagine he's been pressed on that before. Do you think that he's like an ostrich, Mike Johnson is? That he would just bury his head in the sand and pretend like this does not happen? Yeah, he's uh, like, Mike Johnson doesn't strike me as a noticer. I mean, he his head is like buried in the sand it'll come out of china before it like, did you hear what he said recently on uh ukraine or now he's trying to get the government to fund ukraine and israel uh did you hear what he said on fisa warrants i heard he's a go well it was basically you know before i became house speaker i was totally against fisa warrants because of their abuse then i got briefed by the fbi and now i support fisa warrants that's Mike Johnson right here, right there. Uh, Blaze Media put out a clip of that on their Twitter sphere. So, so what they told they told him that he was they were using FISA warrants to spy on people that wanted to do him harm that oh, that they probably entrapped. I mean, so he thought, oh, because it's benefiting him, he's now pro FISA warrant. I mean, I don't. Yeah, I mean, Mike Johnson is Mike Johnson. Yeah, he is who we thought he is. I mean, again, what was his first his first stance was we got to pass support for Israel. And that's how you knew he was a fraud. Right. So I, I want to see if there's like that clip that Tucker Carlson had. And I hope it's heard by Christians throughout the West. I appreciate it. Thank you. So. I, I thought he had the clip where if, you know, you support bombing, uh, it, there was a money line where Tucker said, if you support bombing Christians, you know, and supporting that, then you've lost the thread. And that's kind of the clip from that. So uh, your thoughts on Tucker's questions, because you listen to the whole thing. I, I'd encourage everyone in the audience to listen to the whole thing. I just kind of wanted to take some highlights that were most relevant to theological discussions and uh, you know, evangelical Christians as a whole. But uh, your thoughts on Tucker Carlson as an interviewer in that one? Yeah, it was a good interview. It was very entertaining. You know, again, it was interesting that I watched it because I don't watch everything that he does. And obviously part of his style is letting the person just speak. He's not the one that talks for most of his own interviews. So he, he let the person speak. I mean, he's had a couple that were pretty good, obviously some not as interesting, but yeah, that one's good. The one on the Darian 
Gap was good. Uh, um, Putin one was excellent. The the spy or the guy that's talking about the cyber security infrastructure that was a, another really interesting interview. You've actually watched more Tucker Carlson than so, I have. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, you can learn a lot, especially if you don't know anything at all. And again, so, a lot of people probably learned for the first time a lot of the content in that video. Tucker Carlson had the explicit purpose in my mind to expose how anti-Christian Israel is. That was his agenda for the interview. And, you know, nothing against it. I'm just calling out what he was doing. I actually support what he did. But that is what he was doing. He did an interview to expose that Israel is anti-Christian. That was the purpose of that interview. That is what all the questions in that interview were kind of geared towards, is driving a wedge between evangelical Christians whose religion and faith is not recognized by the Israeli government and the Israel that they believe that they are theologically compelled to support. That is what he was doing. Yeah, I mean, that's basically, I mean, yeah, he's counter signaling a lot of the neoconservatives that basically got him ousted from Fox News. And, you know, obviously, you know, the ADL, he's not necessarily on good terms with the ADL since he, ever since he started talking about replacement theory on Fox News. So there's, so, I mean, yeah, he's got some scores to settle on his own end. And even if you go back to his, like, trips, he was in the Middle East talking about, you know, peace in the Middle East and a ceasefire in Gaza. So he's long been counter-signaling Israel on numerous fronts. So why do you think that is? Do you think Tucker Carlson has some bad experiences in media that you know he's privy to, or do you think he's just become a general noticer, or do you think one led to the other? I mean, obviously he worked in media, so either you're dumb he has to or, you do, or you notice. So that's... That's point number one. And obviously said, you know, influences might have led to his ousting at Fox News. And two, he is a nationalist at heart. He is very America first. So, again, he's probably noticing that, you know, you can't be pro-Israel and America first. The two just do not compute. And anyone that says you can, well, I'm waiting to see that in action. Because aside from Thomas Massey, there's no America first in Congress, in the entire House of Representatives. Well, that certainly is why Thomas Massey, didn't he win Statesman of the Year? I believe so. Because Or yeah. is it Politician of the Year? I forget because what he's the only word, one but he won to it. challenge AI pack. And that is uh, worthy of an award. So I'm going to give the call for last questions. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm going to, let's get some hostile questions. Why don't you... Uh, hit the comments and get challenged. That's from Aaron S. Who's kind of been a nuisance in the comment section. And he wonders why I didn't address uh, comments that were tangents that were unrelated to what we were talking about. You know, I'm not trying to get into a discussion on Calvinism and his dislike of, you know, proper theology here, but you know, he is who he is. And then I'll say, you do realize that Zionism, not Zionist love, anti-Semitism, right? I mean, yeah, that's in the same way that, uh, you know, the, the woke people love racism. I, I, I would probably agree with that is or that, that, yeah, that a question. certain group of people likes the fact that they're hated. That's again, that's, we said that last week with Rabbi Shmuley, his entire point is to be hated, but and, and then he does things. Hate. And then he does things that justify being hated. And again, like he's not selling sex that's toys the, with your daughter. That's the extreme. And then you have the fact that, you know, like Ben Shapiro likes or brags about how he's the most targeted uh, Jew in America. So I'll throw out the last call for questions. Uh, while I say, hey, you can support Evangelical Dark Web at evangelicaldarkweb.org slash join. That's our Patreon like system. Uh, I've been doing some hot, you know, some more behind the scenes content uh, for subscribers there. Uh, I definitely have some more that I want to do uh, for sure. And I, so the whole Trump thing this week, I'm going to give a hot take on that that's going to be behind the paywall, you know. Oh, we didn't want to feel that there's, question there's, now. Uh, we might feed that question next week, but if you want it earlier, for sh if you want it guaranteed in writing, yeah, that's going to be a hot take for the subscribers and supporters. There's your tease. Uh, but otherwise, updates on the book, winning whatnot, win some, we are almost done. 
the whole uh, post production or the pre production, if it's pre print or whatever stuff. I'm almost done with that. Progress is being made on that front. Uh, and another update is I've been pushing the newsletter a lot lately, the Evangelical Dark Web newsletter. We had some issues with that this week because I went over my limit as far as how many emails I could send it at once. Uh, I had to upgrade the plan. The plan was upgraded. But even though I upgraded the plan, it didn't automatically restart the, the cycle. You know, it got turned off. So I had to send out a manual one and then uh, I fixed it, which automatically sent out another email. So it, it's been pretty whack, but it was regulated today. So today we are back on track uh, with the newsletter. There is so much room on the newsletter now. Everyone can sign up. So there's your uh, thing. Uh, th there's your update on that. So we got some questions flooding in. We got, is Michael Brown a Christian? I kind of think Michael Brown is an apologist for false teachers. I mean, and, I mean, I do think he has he some good moments, but I do kind of think he is a false teacher in the in the sense that he is that which he defends. I kind of wrote that on the Sunday article, and I think Justin Peters is kind of like banging his head against the wall because it's like you did all this like effort and diplomacy with Michael Brown just to basically get the well. You still shouldn't have said that on the on the American Gospel conversation about what uh, Benny Hinn was doing in the '90s that he didn't really repent of. So, I mean, and again, he actually, theologically, he actually does believe in a lot of the wacky stuff. And that's just something that is just baked into the cake with Michael Brown. Right. I mean, I'm, I, I try to be ecumenical, especially when people come from different backgrounds. I try to be a little bit more ecumenical with that. It's a little bit different when people are changing denominations willy nilly, uh, it's a little bit different. So if you went from Baptist to Methodist, I would, you know, that's a red flag to me. But yeah, if you came from a charismatic background, I, you know, I'm not going to discount your faith because you came from a background. Uh, Michael Brown obviously comes from a background, but he obviously has a lot of bad theological takes. He defends a lot of false teachers. And at the, at this point, why are you defending people like Michael, Mike Bickle, uh, which he no longer defends because he is he'll get very upset if you say that he defended Mike Bickle, but he, even that's, he did defend Mike Bickle. But that's the game he plays. He is theologically in that camp. It's just I think he made his bones in the 90s uh, doing like the revival stuff, the Brownsville. And obviously he's toned down his stuff because let's be honest, he's old. So, he, you know, he's probably peaked as far as his career goes. And, you know, being more care, oh, I will say hyper charismatic, but. You know, being more eccentric isn't going to really get him a whole lot. So there's not really a motivation to do that on his end. But yeah, back in the day, yeah, he was a lot of the stuff that, you know, these people do currently that he kind of defends. Uh, we have another question about Michael Brown that I'll hit before I get to the other questions. Uh, did Michael Brown ever repent of his mockery at that one one of the fake revivals that he participated uh, no. in? Not the answer is no. He wrote a column in 2021 at Christian Post, which basically said that he was proud of his participation in Brownsville. Okay. So, uh, any comments on the hip hop on, uh, Owen Strand's hypocrisy on Riley Gaines. So Owen Strand has definitely blocked me on the Twitter sphere, at least on one of my accounts. Uh, so I, I don't, I, I was not able, I heard about this secondhand. I don't know if Owen Strand's history with talking about modest dress. I'm not aware of, you know, what level of hypocrisy he personally has on this subject. Riley Gaines, I just think, what do, what can she possibly tell me about transgenderism that I don't already know? That isn't I already self-evident. I call Riley Gaines' participation trophy conservatism because you basically stood up, said that, you know, there's only two genders, people clap like seals, and now you got a, you got a literal platform in conservative ink simply because you said the thing and people clapped. And, and that was after you competed and not before. Yeah. So as far as I'm concerned, this is someone taking 15 minutes of fame and making an entire career out of it. Participation trophy conservatism. Mark, write it's, that down. That's the term we're going to use. And because she's a woman, because people sh think she's that good looking, I'm just saying, I don't think she's really, you know, she tried to do the whole bikini 
pose thing, it's like, okay, well, that's not causing me to stumble. But in any case, I thought the calendar thing was trashy because it wasn't even well done. Uh, I think we kind of, we did the live stream on the calendar thing. Uh, I, I just thought, what can she tell us? Like, what wisdom is there other than hearing her story, which everyone who would be listening to Owen Strand's podcast was probably already familiar with Riley Gaines' story. What more is there to say? Uh, yeah, I mean, she's having an, a much better career than someone like Kyle Rittenhouse, who actually suffered, uh, or he went to jail and was almost going to be locked up for the rest of his life. And also was doing something admirable at the time, and that's defending someone's, you know, livelihood. And that's why he was out there in the first place. So I think someone like Kyle Rittenhouse, who is building a career in conservative media or whatever, but he at least actually did something. Uh, so my thoughts on that. And then do you... Yellow says, do you remember when the the problem with Doug Wilson was that he preached another gospel? What happened to that? So that a lot of people think that he... to like gospel coalition saying, oh, when you're not doing this, you're preaching another no, gospel. No, it has to do with people thought that uh, Doug Wilson believed in a works-based gospel. I don't, I think a lot of that might have been semantics, in my opinion. I, because, you know, if you read the reformers and what they you know, viewed about uh, faith and works and the relationship that, you know, someone like Luther believed that faith and works have, that a lot of Christians might lose their mind right now. Or here's a funny one. When we did the, the live stream with uh, the other Paul and we were going through the Pope's commentary, uh, the Pope endorsed commentary uh, on Jerome. When we read, uh, is it James 2.20 or is it James 4.20? I'm getting dyslexic on my Bible uh, memorization, but faith without works is dead. We read the commentary for that. And it's like, yeah, we kind of agreed with every single word of that. It was, you know, but that might've been based on the original Jerome commentary, which Catholics on the internet pervert. So I, I think people are very leery of Catholic, of the papacy and the popery tricks. And we run the risk of creating a bad theology in response to it. Uh, maybe Doug Wilson's trying to get outsmart the whole debate. I think Doug Wilson has a history of trying to do that, but I don't think Doug Wilson, I'm not convinced he was teaching a different gospel, uh, but that's just me. Or maybe I'm, I'm not, wrong. Maybe I'm not I'm familiar not, enough, enough to research. And uh, obviously if you read Doug Wilson's writing, it's very hard to, it can be very jello to the wall because it's very long winded. And that's like a positive to Doug Wilson's style because it's very conversational. But at the same time, if you need him to lay out an assertion and like a concise assertion, that's just not how he writes. OK, so I think the context is that he uh, Doug Wilson claims to hold Westminster Confession of Faith, which rejects infused righteousness. But he teaches it on his website. Uh, OK, yeah. I, I'm not as familiar with all the Presbyterian uh, politics uh, or theology. I thought it was just I thought it was just concupiscence. He disagreed with the, <laughs> the Westminster Confession. Yeah, uh, yes. Concupiscence. Very important debate uh, that Doug Wilson's not on the right side of. So those were our questions for today. Good questions. You guys brought it. Uh, that being said, don't forget to hit the like button on your way out. We'll have a fun stream next week on conservatism. But until then, uh, you know, stay based. Christ is king, and we will.